the session in which we're going to be working in chapter 14. Chapter 14 discusses the cost of capital. So what is the cost of capital? The cost of capital is basically how much it's costing you to raise money. What's the cost of money? Well, there's a cost for money. Whatever you have to pay back in terms of rewarding the lender or the investor is the cost of capital that the company will have to incur. Now, how are we going to measure the cost of capital? Well, we're going to look at the cost of equity first, then we're going to look at the cost of preferred stock. We're going to look at the cost of that. So how can we finance a company? Well, how can you finance a company? You can use stocks and to be more specific here, common stock. You could use stock, but those stocks are preferred stock or you could use obviously that you could use obviously that all sorts of that short term that long term that and obviously what's the other what's the other uh, what's the other uh, uh, form of financing is internal financing this is when the company internally finance itself we're going to be looking at the cost of capital how much does it cost you we're going to start with the cost of equity which is stocks and we're going to be using something called the dividend growth model and we looked at this dividend growth model in chapter 8 but it's worth going back and looking at the dividend growth model so hopefully you remember the dividend growth model it's going to be a review then we're going to look at the advantages and the disadvantages for this model okay so the easiest way to estimate the cost of equity is to use the dividend growth model so one thing we learn about the dividend growth model it's the easiest so it's an easy way to do so because we're gonna we're gonna look at another model shortly so what is the dividend growth model if you remember the price of the stock p0 equal to the current dividend times one plus the growth rate so basically the the, the numerator basically it goes to d1 which is the future dividend this is the future dividend divided by r minus g and hopefully you remember this d0 is the dividend just paid d1 is the next period dividend projected dividend basically notice that we have to use r of e the e stand for equity so this is the required return on stock so how much do you want to earn on the stock so now basically this is what we're looking for here we're, we're looking for the required return of the stock if we rearrange the formula and we just looked for r of e r of e equal to d1 the future dividend divided by the price plus the growth rate okay so basically we just find the just all what we did is we took this formula you know p0 equal to d1 over r of e minus g and we solve for r and e so now we have the cost the equation for the cost of equity okay because r of e is the return that shareholders require on the stock and can be interpreted as it's the firm cost of equity if this is how much the investors wants to earn let's assume 15 percent if that's what they want to earn it means that's the cost that the company will have to incur to raise the to raise the fund so let's go ahead and implement this approach so to estimate the return on equity using the dividend approach model we obviously need three pieces so we need the price today the dividend paid today and the growth rate that the company is going to incur of these for a publicly traded company dividend paying company the first two can be observed directly so it's easy to look at the price today it's easy to look at the dividend today so that's easy to obtain only the third component the expected growth is must be estimated so the we don't know g so g in this equation is estimated and once you have an estimate it means there's a room for error so remember that's going to be one of the weakness that you're estimating g in order to find the required rate of return so let's take a look at an example to see how this works to estimate the return on equity suppose a greater state public service a large utility company had just paid four dollars in dividend so the, the four dollars in dividend they just paid what do we call this we call this d0 so d0 equal to four dollars the stock currently sells for sixty dollars that's p0 equal to sixty dollars you estimate that the dividend will grow at a steady rate of six percent and the growth rate of the dividend is six percent so we pretty much have everything and we assume it's in infinite into the future what's the cost of equity of 
of this business. So first, let's find the future dividend. The future dividend is the current dividend D0 times 1 plus G. So $4 times 1 plus 1.06. So D1, we find the numerator. It's going to be $4.24. Now, we're just going to have go ahead and plug in the figure. So we have D1, $4.24. This is D1 divided by the current price of $60 plus 0 0.06. And that's going to give us a required rate of return of this on the stock is 13.06. Now, what we do, what we assume, now what we assume, what we, what we can say that the cost of equity is 13.06. So as a company, you have to earn 13.06 to, to satisfy the equity holder, which is that is going to be your cost of equity. Now let's talk about G because we we, we we kind of looked at G, but we did not really cover G. So G is the growth rate. How can you come up with the growth rate? Okay. As we said, for publicly traded companies, you might have some historical data. So to use the dividend growth rate, we must come up with an estimate for G, the growth rate. There are essentially two ways of doing this. You could use historical growth rate or use the analyst forecast of future growth rate. So you could use the past or you could use what the analyst forecasting, okay? An analyst forecast will be available from a variety of sources. Naturally, different sources will have different estimates. So one approach might be to obtain a multiple estimate than average them. So if obviously, once you are doing estimates, you're not gonna come up with the same estimate. No, no, no one's gonna come up with the same number, but if they give you a series of estimates, you can average them. Or we could observe dividend from prior year. This is using the historical method. Okay, let's look at the historical method and let's look for this company. In 2010, they paid $1.10 in dividend. 2011, they paid $1.20. 2012, they paid $1.35. 2013, they paid $1.40. In 2014, they paid $1.55. Now, what we can do, we can calculate the dollar change as well as the percentage change from year to year. For example, uh, between 2010 and 2011, the change was $0.10. Cent and if we take 10 cent divided by the base, which is dollar ten, the percentage growth is 9.09. Once again, let me show you what I did. So this way, let's not take things for granted. So the change, so the increase was 10 cent, and the previous, the increase was 10 cent, and based on a dollar ten from the prior year. So your uh, so the percentage is 9%. Notice between 2011 to 2012. So notice between 2011 and 2012, $1.35 minus $1.20. The increase was 15 cent. Now we can divide this by the base, $1.20. And the increase was 12.5%. And you'll do the same thing from 12 uh, 2012 to 2013 and from 2013 to 2014 and we notice the percentage change were 9.09 12.5 3.7 and 10.71 now which one do we use well we can average them okay notice that we calculated the change in dividend on a year-to-year -year basis which is this is an explanation of what we did so what we do we're going to average the four the four growth rate and basically we're going to take all four growth rate divide them by four and we'll get nine percent so notice, this is a simple arithmetic average, okay? Because remember, we have geometric and, and, uh, and simple average. Now, if we also calculated the geometric growth rate, the dividend growth from 1.1 to $1.55 over a four-year period, what's the compound? Well, we can see it's 8.95. So it's very similar. It's very similar. So in this situation, if you use 9% or 8.95, if you use the geometric, or the average, they're pretty much the same because the difference is not that significant, 0 0.05. And remember, they're both estimate because, not estimate, they're both based on past results, so it doesn't mean it's gonna get guarantee future results. So it's in a sense, you're estimating the future, which is if it's 9% or 8.95, they're both estimate. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of the, this approach, which is the, um, the uh, dividend growth model. Basically, we talked about the advantages and disadvantages as we are discussing this, but let's go ahead and summarize it. Well, the primary advantage, it's simple, and it's both easy to understand and easy to use. Okay, there are few disadvantages. 
The dividend growth model is obviously applicable to only companies that pay what? That pay dividend. This means that the approach is useless when the company don't pay any dividend. So because remember, you are using the dividend growth model. So if the company doesn't pay any dividend, you cannot use the dividend growth model. Okay? As the previous example illustrate, there will be never there will never be exactly the case. So so dividend it's gonna change from year to year. Okay. So the model is only applicable where the dividend is has a steady growth. Okay, so the dividend is constant, constantly, okay? Because otherwise you have to take the average. The second problem is that the estimated of cost of equity is very sensitive to the growth rate. For a given stock, an upward revision of G by just 1% increase the estimated cost of equity by a full, at least a full percentage point. So G is just an estimate, okay? Because D1 will probably be revised upward as well. So if G increases, the future dividend will also increases. And finally, this approach does not explicitly consider risk. So as we saw from the SML approach, or we're going to see next, there's a there's a no direct adjustment for the riskiness of the investment. So we're not taking how risky is the investment in terms of the cost of equity, because the riskier the investment, the higher should be the cost of equity. Okay, for example, there's no allowance for the degree of uncertainty surrounding the estimated growth for the rate of dividend. So the next thing we're gonna look at is another approach, and this is called the SML approach. We looked at it in chapter 13. We're gonna look at it again here. If you have any questions, any comments, by all means, email me.